So we are starting today uh, with the pre-malignant lesions of the oral cavity, and then I'll go on to oral submucous fibrosis, which is, I think, very, very common in this part of the world, and not so common in the Western literature. So uh, there are three or four pre-malignant lesions, which as plastic surgeons, I think we all should know. The first is uh, the three of them mainly, which I'll be discussing today is leukoplakia, uh, erythroplakia, and chronic hyperplastic candidiasis. So these are the three lesions which are considered to carry a definite risk of malignant change. But then there are some other conditions that themselves are not pre-malignant, but are associated with a higher than normal incidence of oral cancer. And these are oral submucosal fibrosis, which we'll be discussing in detail in the next half of our talk. Then there's a condition called syphilitic glossitis, which isn't so common now, I think, with uh, syphilis being treated properly, and sideropenic dysphagia. And there are some oral conditions uh, with doubt whether the association is casual or causal with oral cancers. So we haven't been able to prove whether these are pre-malignant or whether they turn into cancers. And these are oral lichen planus. This is called lupus erythematosus and dyskeratosis congenii. So I'm just going to limit my pre-malignant lesions talk to the first three. So leukoplakia, what is leukoplakia? Who has defined it as any white patch or plaque that cannot be characterized clinically or pathologically as any other disease? So what are its clinical features? Uh, it's homogene. It may be homogeneous. It may be speckled. It may be nodular and it may be varicose. So its potential for malignant change is between 3 and 6%. So how do you manage a case which comes to you where you suspect there is leukoplakia? After, your, um, after you see the patient, the first thing you have to advise is immediate stoppage of tobacco consumption. Then you, so you can take biopsies from the suspicious areas, the areas where, where there is induration or ulceration. Or if you see hyperemia, that is again a danger sign. So if you get severe epithelial dysplasia or carcinoma in C2 on biopsy, then obviously you do an excision. It may be surgical, it may be with a CO2 laser, and you can then close it primarily or leave it for spontaneous epithelization or maybe give a graft if the lesion is bigger. But when you have mild to moderate dysplasia on biopsy, you need to excise it immediately. You can keep the patient under close follow-up at three monthly intervals, and when there's any change, do the needful. So this is a patient, uh, you can see the kinds of leukoplakia. Yeah, the one on the right is the, uh, point, the, the one on the right is the, um, uh, the normal leukoplakia, and here you can see uh, this is something known as speckled leukoplakia. Now again, erythroplakia is defined by the World Health Organization as any lesion of the oral mucosa that presents as a bright red velvety plaque that cannot be characterized clinically or pathologically as any other recognizable condition. Now this is much more dangerous than leukoplakia. It has a 17-fold higher incidence of malignant transformation. And in every case, you'll find areas of dysplasia or carcinoma in situ or invasive carcinoma. So there is no waiting on these lesions. All areas have to be completely excised, either uh, surgically or with a laser, and they have to be sent for histopathology and the needful done. So this is another patient. You can see this reddish area here and here. These are the typical erythroplakic lesions. And I come to the third condition, which is chronic hyperplastic candidiasis. Uh, this is seen as dense chalky plaques of keratin. It's usually thick and more opaque than a leukoplakia. It's common at the oral commissure. So often you'll see it at the commissure with extension into the skin of the face as well. And uh, surgical excision is again recommended, especially if the lesion is persistent or it's recurrent. This is one of the palate, but usually you can see it at the commissure also. So now I come on to the next part of my talk, which is oral submucous fibrosis. So in 1952, Schwartz coined the term atrophica idiopathica mucosa oris to describe an oral fibrosing lesion. Joshi from India subsequently coined the term oral submucous fibrosis for the condition in 1953. 
So what is oral submucous fibrosis? It is a chronic debilitating disease of the oral cavity, which is characterized by inflammation and progressive fibrosis of the submucosal tissues. That is the lamina, lamina propria and the deeper connective tissues. So oral submucous fibrosis results in markedly, marked rigidity and inability to open the mouth. And the buccal mucosa, as we all know, is the most common site involved. You'll find these patients often uh, with oral malignancies also, and they are unable to open their mouth at all. So this condition, as I told you earlier, is a pre-malignant lesion. And the main thing is that it is very predominant in all parts of Southeast Asia and India because we have the habit of chewing pan or beetle quid. And uh, the prevalence of OSMF in India has been estimated to range from 0.2 uh, to 2% in males and 1.2 to 4.6% in females. And the age range is also very broad. It is seen in patients as young as 11 and obviously in older patients it's commoner. So what is the etiopathogenesis of this disease? It's multifactorial and uh, what happens is that the, um, these factors, they trigger the disease process by causing an inflammatory reaction in the oral mucosa. So we all know the factors, it's this areca nut chewing, of course chilies are also supposed to cause it and there may be certain nutritional deficiencies and immunological processes which hasten uh, the fibrosis. So to tell you a little bit about the actual uh, etiopathogenesis, so when areca nut is chewed, it releases some alkaloids which increase the collagen in the submucous layer. Then the trauma caused during chewing itself, it causes inflammation of the mucosa, which releases cytokines and growth factors. And then you see, you don't chew Araco nut alone. They contain all kinds of tannins, copper and catechins, especially in the coating, which decrease the phagocytosis and again cause collagen stimulation. So all these factors together uh, lead to the submucous fibrosis, which we see. So what happens is that the healthy buccal mucosa looks something like this, whereas uh, uh, this in oral submucous fibrosis, you can see the dense fibrosis in the submucosal layer with uh, the thinning of the epithelial layer. So uh, there is a classification which is both functional as well as clinical. So in the functional staging, the stage one is the intensizal mouth opening is up to or greater than 35 mm. So if it's more than 3.5 centimeter, it's M1. If it is between 25 and 35, it's M2. M3 is between 15 and 25. And if it's less than 15, then it is M4. And when you see the patient clinically, if you palpate the mucosa or you see it, in the stage one, you'll see there's just stomatitis or some blanching of the mucosa. In stage two, you can palpate some fibrous brands in the buccal mucosa, often in the oropharynx, and they may or may not be stomatitis. But in stage three, these uh, fibrous bands become more palpable. And uh, in stage four, there is potentially malignant disorders like erythroplakia and leukoplakia with any uh, with the other, other parts of stage three. And often you get these patients in current, current cases of oral squamous cell carcinoma, you'll find that the patient has a growth but is unable to open the mouth even for your examination. So there are a host of uh, non-surgical management when you find the patient in the earlier stages. And these include lycopene, curcumin is an extract from haldi and uh, you know it's available in uh, tablet form now. And then you have all kinds of micronutrients. Local injection of steroids or hyaluronidase uh, is supposed to relieve this, just like in Ducutrin's contracture. Then uh, colchicine, placental extract, and pentoxyphylin are supposed to also help. And uh, sometimes they say that physiotherapy, obviously, with the mouth opening jack and ultrasound to the region, uh, may delay the progress of this disease. But by the time uh, they come to us, usually they need surgical management. And uh, so there are release procedures. The surgical management is basically divided into two. The one is the release procedures, which you can do either by your scalpel or by the laser. And the second, which is very, very important, is the coronoidectomy. 
and then uh, obviously once you have released the mucosa you have created a defect so you have to fill in the defect earlier uh, you know it used to be left to epithelize or give uh, skin grafts were given but it has been found that these skin grafts and uh, again contracts so they are not used anymore so there are a variety of local flaps and of course free flaps which i'll be discussing as we go along so how do you give these cuts the first is that when you give uh, when it's grade 1 you just give two parallel cuts in the mucosa and help the mucosa to release but when it's grade 2 and 3 these cuts enough are not uh, these cuts are not enough so you have to do a coronoidectomy and that area has to be covered either by a mucoperiosteal flap or from the mandible itself or a palatal flap and when you have grade 4 you obviously have to do a greater reconstruction so you will need uh, there is the platysma myocutaneous flap which personally we have not used we usually use the either the nasolabial flap or the radial forearm free flap so this is the incision so you see the incision what i told you either it goes into parallel cuts or it goes as a y like this and this is in the area of the coronoid so this will help you to Uh, do the coronoidectomy so uh, you have to take uh, proper care that you don't cut the commissure so it has to as i told you that uh, you can do this y or you can also do a t where you give a uh, like parallel incision like this just behind the commissure and then go on vertically over the entire height of the coronoid and then again go back towards the retromolar trigo so uh what happens is that you have to release all the muscles the pterygoid and the masseter along the ramus and you have to stay subperiosteally on the mandible when you go to do the uh, coronoidectomy and you have to do both sides because if you do only one side uh then it doesn't help the patient and uh, you have to bear the coronoid process completely so that it is in your hand before you do the cut for the coronoidectomy so why is coronoidectomy so important not just the soft tissue release because the main uh, reason this coronoidectomy dramatically improves the results is that it gets rid of the strong pull of the temporalis muscle and that helps to release uh, the mouth and helps in mouth opening so uh, this is uh, one of our patients you can see uh, he's had uh, she's had a, you know she was a um, uh, she was keeping a betel nut quid came from the northeast part of india and had a, had a laser uh, excision elsewhere in the country and had come back with no inter incisal opening so we even to so obviously she had a nasotracheal intubation and then uh we did the first cuts just to open the mouth then we went right behind and did the coronoidectomy and you can see that on the right uh, this area has been reconstructed with the radial uh, forearm free flap and on the left we put in a nasolabial flap this is another uh, pros, uh, case where we just had to do the coronoidectomy and we gave a mandibular periosteal flap so you can see this is the incision as you can see the retractor also can go in between the teeth and once one side is done that side opens up this is the first side being done then you can see it's opened up and at the end of the procedure you have got a uh, interincisal opening of around 35 mm now this is the patient whom i showed you in the beginning she is i think 5 years post surgery and you can still see that she is able to open the mouth and uh, these uh, these all are the result of this tobacco chewing and if these patients go back to this habit then the disease will recur so uh, as i told you earlier that uh, once you're just doing an excision you have to replace the mucosa and uh, uh, skin grafts or, uh, with a split thickness or full thickness are discouraged because they will uh, allow the base of the defect to contract alloplastic material as we all know is not preferred and it will uh, cause uh, intense scarring and recurrence even uh, you know collagen sheets and all which were used at some time they last for a few days and cause problems so obviously vascularized flaps from intraoral or extra oral oral sources are the best and uh, if you have an adequate flap you know you can do an adequate release and excision 
and obviously your reconstruction is planned as per the grade of uh, the trismus and intraoperatively uh, operatively often teeth have to be removed to facilitate not only the release but to allow your flap also to settle by so uh, in grade 1 and 2 as i've already shown you you can use mucosal flaps or the tongue flap and in grade 3 when you have a larger defect due to the and you do a coronoidectomy then the palatal flap may be necessary to close the defect and in grade 4 uh, when the mandible is exposed you can do a platysma myocutaneous flap which is an option but what we normally do is the radial forearm flap where you have a huge flap which can cover the whole defect there is another flap which is used often known as the fat flap or the uh, uh, the buccal pad of fat is often just teased into the defect uh this is a good flap but what happens is that you're not sure about its blood supply and because it doesn't have epithelium it may uh, heal by secondary intention now nasolabial flaps as i showed you they are very very good flaps they're very robust and they're tunneled into the through a gap in the cheek into the mouth and uh, of course they have a disadvantage that if your cut is big and there's a big gap uh, which is formed then they are small in size so they may be difficult to use in grade 3 or 4 uh trismus and though they leave scars in the beginning these scars usually heal very well so you can see another of our patients uh, where this uh flap the nasolabial flap was given in again to release the trismus you can see his mouth opening this is about 5 years down the line and you can see the well healed scar which doesn't often cause any problems and now uh, uh, you know with the advent of perforators and all you can often dissect out the perforator and then just uh, stitch the flap into position so this is again another case where we use the perforator flap and you can see it has gone into the coronoidectomy uh, area and the mouth opening now tongue flaps are also very often used because a laterally uh, lateral posterior based tongue flap can be uh, harvested and rotated into the defect in the retromolar area as we all know these are very uh sturdy flaps or of course the disadvantage is there may be a fold formation which may have to be divided if it's causing a uh, problem so you can see again uh, how a tongue flap can be harvested and rotated into the defect although this is for a carcinoma but uh, you this is the same area where your defect will be caused after a coronoidectomy <laughs> then the mandibular mucoperiosteal flap is just there it's taken from the medial aspect of the mandible and though it's a random pattern flap it is very very reliable and it can be used to close the defect after a coronoidectomy and again palatal uh, mucoperiosteal flaps as plastic surgeons we are very very familiar with the pattern of the flap and the greater palatine heart artery and its uh, direction so based on that you can raise a island flap and fit it into the defect and it can be used for two three or four great trismus patients and uh, you can often leave a, a small bridge behind to increase the venous drainage of the flap now again the palat platysmal mu myocutaneous flap which i have never personally used is of course another local flap uh which the branch comes from the mental branch of the facial artery in the submental region this can be again lifted up and it's a large flap and it can be harvested into the cheek so it is you uh, it is raised with the external jugular vein and it is tunneled in the subcutaneous plane over the mandible into the cheek and it can be used for grade 4 uh, trismus where large defects are caused and obviously uh, these are other cases of christmas with uh, concurrent carcinomas where we have used the radial forearm flap after the release and uh, uh, that is just the talk about uh, our oral uh, submucous fibrosis and uh, just before completing i'd like to share our experience in a case of fibrous dysplasia of the mandible uh, 
uh, you can see these uh, uh, multiple cysts he had in the mandible and uh, despite several uh, conservative attempts um, this is persisted so we decided to go in for a uh, reconstruction uh, obviously with the fibula but using the cutting guides with the cat cam technology so just trying i'm sharing some results with you because i thought this would be again of uh, uh, used to the pgt so this is the excised specimen it's again an angle to angle defect and this was the mandible which had been reconstructed by the cat cam technology this is our excised specimen and this is how uh, the cutting guides are sent and this is how they are put on the uh, fibula and they tell you about where to make the cuts and this is how it was put on to the fibula and then the fibula was ostomized and uh, we did the intraosseous dental implants at the same sitting you can see three implants in situ and this is the three months post operative uh, picture of the patient he is undergoing rehabilitation still the teeth abutments have to be placed uh, thank you